there, everyone. My name is Ari, and welcome to Made of Metal, a motivational podcast where we tell stories about regular people overcoming insurmountable odds. So, hey there, everyone. Fancy seeing you here. <laughs> this week's story is a real, real treat because I love stories that have an almost fairy tale arc. Like life is always stranger than fiction. And this individual story has always fascinated me. But I can definitively say that it was reading the quotes from this person that first drew me to their story. This individual was the literal definition of compassion and charity, believing in giving their best efforts towards bettering the greater good. This individual worked tirelessly to bring awareness to an established system that caused chaos, division, and violence amongst the people. And this person was just an incredible leader and orator, and they were able to move the people, to inspire the people, to evoke change in the people. So much respect for this person and their philanthropy, their resoluteness, and their strength. So today, we will be discussing the helper, the humble, the humanitarian, Nelson Mandela. So I've been practicing the pronunciation for quite some time, guys. So please bear with me. You already know how much I love a unique name, and this was a doozy. I so loved learning it. I just love people that have unique names. Nelson Mandela was born July 18th, 1918, in a tiny village in South Africa. Nelson Mandela's birth name was not Nelson. It was Holy Hlahla Mandela. I thought this was pure perfection, that Holy Hlahla roughly translates to someone who creates mischief or trouble. Like, how cool is that? Your name literally means troublemaker. It's like, hey, trouble. Literally. Hey, holy la la. I'm so jealous. Like, I love that. I think that is so amazing. And if I butchered that pronunciation too terribly, you have my full permission to absolutely destroy me in <laughs> the online forums. <laughs> but know that I tried, okay? Give me my credit. I tried. But Nelson's father was a chief who provided guidance to the tribal leadership. And his mother was a stay-at-home mom who helped to raise the children and maintain the household. So Nelson had a large family with more than 10 siblings who all lived relatively close by. Nelson's father held a position of respect within the tribe, which afforded their family wealth and stability within the village. Unfortunately, after a disagreement with a tribal official, Nelson's father was stripped of his position, and the family suffered major financial losses. They were forced to flee to a nearby village, which allowed them anonymity and the opportunity to start over. The village was located in the rural grasslands, much more remote and agriculturally focused. Nelson learned to adapt to living a country lifestyle, spending most of his time outdoors playing with the other boys in his village. Another really cool tidbit is that Nelson was the first of his family to receive formal schooling. Now, I don't know if you guys noticed in my previous episodes, I always clarify by saying formal schooling to essentially differentiate between other methods of learning. I'm a firm believer that there are other avenues for gaining knowledge other than going to an institution. So it's important to acknowledge those as well. But it was at this early juncture in Nelson's life that he would first be exposed to the consequences of colonialism in his country. When the South African children would attend school, they would often be given Christian names to replace their birth names. This is where Holy Hlahla first became Nelson, as the name was given to him by his teacher. In 1930, after his father passed away unexpectedly, Nelson was adopted by an old family friend. This family friend was a chief, and Nelson was again returned to the more refined lifestyle he'd become accustomed to as the son of a tribal counselor. 
Nelson was able to reap the benefits of having access and status, continuing his schooling along with the chief's other two children. The children learned about many subjects, but Nelson was naturally curious about African history. Nelson was also exposed to differing cultures and tribes while he was living with his adopted family. The tribesmen would educate Nelson on their history and how they were once a connected people before the perils of colonialism. When Nelson was in his teen years, he participated in a traditional male rite of passage with other boys in his village. During the ceremony, Nelson was disheartened by a speech given by one of the chiefs. Native South Africans had been suffering tremendously at the hands of colonialism, and the chief spoke on just how bad the circumstances were for the men. It was at this event that Nelson fully committed to the goal of uniting South Africa. While living with his adopted family, Nelson was trained in the same position as his father, preparing to act as an advisor to the tribal leadership. After coming of age, Nelson attended college at the University of Fort Hare, a prestigious university that was known for accepting only the greatest of minds. While at university, Nelson engaged in his first act of political resistance by aligning with a student body who demanded change while serving on the student council. He was ultimately kicked out of school due to his actions and sent back home. When the chief heard about Nelson's actions and expulsion from school, he moved quickly to demand Nelson return to school and adhered to a plan for an upcoming arranged marriage. After hearing the chief's plans for his future, Nelson ran away from home to the city of Johannesburg in order to strike out on his own. While in Johannesburg, he enrolled in law school and became a lawyer, beginning a lengthy career in criminal justice. Now, before we discuss the latter part of Nelson's life, I wanted to give a formal definition of apartheid, and this was taken from Wikipedia. Apartheid was a system of institutionalized racial segregation that existed in South Africa and Southwest Africa from 1948 until the early 1990s. It was at this point in Nelson's life that his goal of fighting for the freedom of his fellow South Africans became a reality. Around 1942, Nelson would join an anti-apartheid group called the African National Congress, and along with other young and like-minded individuals, formed the African National Congress Youth League. These groups worked to create a movement that would inspire South Africans to fight for their independence, using modern strategies and more direct action, as opposed to the usual peace talks that had been in progress so far. Nelson dedicated more than 20 years of his life to working on fighting the South African government with nonviolent means, starting his own law firm with a friend from law school. This was the first Black law firm in South Africa and specifically worked on counseling and representing the native South African people. During this time, Nelson was organizing nonviolent campaigns to gain the attention of the South African government, bringing awareness to the plights of his neighbors and working to dismantle the racist discrimination in place. Nelson wasn't just in the office coordinating change. He was also boots on the ground, on the front lines, pushing the agenda of freedom for all. In response, the government would employ intimidation tactics, such as false arrests and imprisonment for any activists that were caught. Luckily, Nelson was initially able to escape imprisonment until the fateful day in 1961, although he was arrested more than once by this time. Over the years, Nelson was able to establish himself in the anti-apartheid community as a leader and as such was able to mobilize his own group called MK. The South African people had become disillusioned and lost faith in the government to fairly remove the apartheid, with the government always pushing back any attempts to peacefully move forward. 
In the early 1960s, Nelson helped to coordinate a massive national worker strike across the country in order to highlight the mistreatment of Native South Africans. Around 1963, Nelson was captured and arrested for his role in the strike, resulting in him being brought to trial not just once, but twice. Nelson had to endure an unfair trial and was sentenced to life in prison. This would have been a devastating verdict for any person, but they did not know Nelson. Nelson was severely abused and actually contracted tuberculosis while he was incarcerated. Incredibly, the South African government still considered Nelson a threat and made attempts on his life while he was in prison, but were never successful. Yes, they actually tried to assassinate him while he was already imprisoned. Also, another great fact about Nelson's incarceration, despite the fact that he was being mistreated beyond belief as a political prisoner and as a Black person, Nelson was able to earn his law degree through the University of London while he was incarcerated. Nelson's case began to garner international attention and support as people became aware of his fight for the people. After being falsely imprisoned for more than 20 years, eventually, Nelson and his fellow members began to have talks with the South African government in order to coordinate their release on the wave of all this support that he'd gained over time. This was also a painstaking process that didn't have any true traction until a new president was elected. President Frederick Willem de Klerk was elected in South Africa, and one of the first things he did was coordinate for Nelson's release under all the terms he'd been fighting for since the beginning. The first thing Nelson did upon his release was urge those involved in the movement to continue the pressure until the government reformed for the better, in particular when the South African Black population were given the right to vote. Nelson was also elected the president of the ANC in 1991. And just three years later, Nelson was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize for his anti-apartheid work in peace talks with President de Klerk. Nelson worked with the president to organize the first open election that included black and white candidates amongst the intense chaos and demonstrations happening across the country during the country's reformation period. Thankfully, due to the dutiful and steady negotiation work, a level-headed and intelligent approach to speaking with the public during this process, as well as managing the balance of being a leader, Nelson was able to secure the first true democratic election in South Africa. On April 27, 1994, to no one's surprise, Nelson Mandela was elected as the first Black president of South Africa. This was an incredible feat, especially after being imprisoned for more than 20 years. Not to mention, he was 77 years old. Nelson would begin the hard and long road of uniting a country that had been historically tense and divided, supporting his people through a economic collapse, as well as securing the rights to vote and a centralized democratic government. After serving his term as president, Nelson retired from politics, but not from his humanitarian work. He continued to advocate for causes such as education and health care for his people, especially those in the more rural areas of the country while continuing to act as a counselor in certain areas as well. Nelson was even an advisor and mediator during a civil war in a neighboring country. In 2007, with his wife, Nelson co-founded an organization called The Elders. The Elders were comprised of political, social, and economic powerhouses and players who all wanted to come together to share their knowledge. 
The goal of the elders was to work and correct global issues using the combined intelligence and experience of those within the group. Nelson worked tirelessly to secure the freedoms of not just his people, but all people, all the way up until his passing. As Nelson aged, he began to experience health issues and would often have to be hospitalized for long periods of time. Sadly, Nelson Mandela passed away on December 5, 2013, in his home in Johannesburg, the very place he had been imprisoned so many years ago. I honestly cannot fully encompass or quantify the impact this person has had on his country and the globe. Nelson Mandela was a person who had a vision, not just for a better future for himself, but for those around him. His commitment to securing freedom up against an unrelenting force with unlimited power, like he was going against the actual government who can pretty much do whatever they want. To continue in the face of such an opponent That takes a level of determination that is almost supernatural. And then to be incarcerated falsely and to come out and to still maintain your core self. How does one face their ultimate enemy, be taken and falsely imprisoned for decades and not lose hope? Nelson did not allow his current circumstances to penetrate his psyche. He was not afraid of the consequences of his actions, even if those consequences led to the loss of his own freedoms. The emotional fortitude, the vision for the future, the ability to connect with those in high political positions, as well as the everyday people who are working on the farms and in the cities. Nelson could connect with them all. To say he was a leader, in my opinion, is not adequate. Nelson wasn't a leader. He was change in a single person. He was change personified, an unstoppable force who didn't need to use force at all. And here, I had to use this quote at the end because honestly, this is a quote that just makes me want to go out there and fight the power. (laughs) You know what I mean? Like it is truly motivating to hear that people continue on no matter what. And they continue on in the face of certain death and they know it. And this is also important because Nelson acknowledged that civil issues were just as pressing with native South Africans as they were with those who were involved in colonialism, which I also thought was so important. So during my lifetime, I have dedicated myself to the struggle of the African people. I have fought against white domination and I have fought against black domination. I have cherished the ideal of a democratic and free society in which all persons live together in harmony and with equal opportunities. It is an ideal which I hope to live for and to achieve. But if needs be, It is an ideal for which I am prepared to die. You can check us out at madeofmetalpodcast.com. I wanted to make a personal ask to everybody listening. If you can just tell a friend about me, if they're into history, weird nerdy girls, (laughs) inspiration, motivation. I am so excited. I have so many great ideas for upcoming seasons. And if you can recommend me, I would, I can't describe how much I would appreciate it. It would be a lot. You can also review me everywhere you can. I like feedback. I want the good feedback. I want the bad feedback. I want all the feedback. So please, 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 please. I would really appreciate just honestly reaching out to me. I love to hear from you guys. This has just been such a joy. I say it every single episode and it's true every single episode. I love making this show and I want to continue to do that. So as always, it has been such a pleasure. Please like, support, subscribe, review, and tell a friend, tell a friend, tell a friend. And you can find this on Instagram if you are very, very interested in joining the community. 
We are at Made of Metal Podcast. So that's Metal, M-E-T-T-L-E. And as always, my loves, such a pleasure. Bloom where you are planted. Bye.